Praise the Lord, everyone. It's just after 8 o'clock. We're going to start. Apologies for one or two people who came for a 7.30 start. Um, the wee sheet was actually just a half an hour too early. And, uh, but sure, at least you're here and you got the best seat in the house if you came early. You're probably starving, but sure, you can always get a feed later on. Everybody say a big praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We're coming into the Easter weekend and we're here tonight. Good Friday evening, just to worship and praise the name of the Lord. And let me say a big thank you to each and every one of you for coming tonight. A tremendous crowd, and we really do appreciate your support. We're going to worship the Lord together just for a few minutes. There's still people coming and finding seats. And we're going to sing just some lovely worship choruses. We're going to start off with a lovely, well-known chorus. All hail the Lamb enthroned on high then. Everyone, let's just worship the Lord together then, just to settle our hearts and just to get tuned in to Him tonight. Then everyone then. All hail the Lamb. Come on everyone, let's sing it. chorus number two then on our chorus sheet blessed jesus come to me soothe my soul with songs of peace then right into the chorus glorious marvelous grace that rescued me we're not here tonight to remember someone who died and stayed in the grave we're here tonight to remember a savior who paid the ultimate price who performed the greatest act of love that a human man or woman could ever perform in giving his life in our place but praise god it didn't end at golgotha it was only the start because on the third day he rose again and he's alive tonight so let's worship him and let's praise his lovely name blessed jesus come to me then everyone blessed
praise the Lord. We're going to sing one more chorus, and then we're going to ask God's blessing on all that will take place tonight. Let's sing that lovely chorus. It's number six on your chorus sheet. Jesus, draw me close, closer, Lord, to you. And let's all stand together as we sing it. We'll sing it twice through, and then we'll just commit this evening to the Lord in prayer then. Jesus, draw me close, everyone then. Jesus, draw me Heavenly Father, we praise you tonight for your love and your goodness and your mercy to each one of us. And Father, we thank you again for the privilege of coming into your lovely presence. And we come tonight in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, him whom we love and serve. Father, we thank you for your Son. Thank you that you sent him into this sin-cursed world 2,000 years ago, thank you for the sacrifice that he made to redeem us from our sins. And tonight we tell you that we love him. And we realize tonight that we only love him because he first loved us. And Father, as we tell this story tonight about your son, about the lives that he touched, about the people who encountered him as he journeyed in this earth, Father, we pray that, Lord, you would open hearts. We pray, Father, th for those who as yet don't know you as Savior, that, Lord, tonight you would reveal yourself to them and you would glorify your name in their lives by bringing them to your feet and saving them for time and for eternity. Thank you for every head bowed in your presence tonight, for those who have traveled great distances to be here. Father, we pray that you'll bless them. And Father, for those of us who have travel father short distances father we pray too that your blessing will rest upon each and every one as we listen to the old old story tonight shut us in with yourself thank you already for your lovely presence father we pray that above everything that you'll glorify your name and we'll give you all the praise and that name that we love the name of the lord jesus christ amen amen you may be seated there Well, let me just welcome each and every one of you tonight to the Metropolitan Tabernacle. If you're here for the first time, let me welcome you and tell you that you're very welcome tonight, and we trust that you'll enjoy your time with us. We've worked hard for this night for the last three months or so, and we're just so thankful to the Lord for giving us this opportunity to bring this lovely story 
to you tonight. The night's racing on. I don't want to keep you too late. But just one or two wee things. Could I just ask you, um, if you could try and hold off your applause until the very end of, of the evening, because we, we're trying to tell a story here tonight, unlike a concert where there's different um, people involved in different groups, um, we're telling a story right through. And if we can just hold, now would you hear this word? I've been using this word three months with the choir. If we can just hold our continuity. You're supposed to go, oh. <laughs> we're just gonna hold the whole thing together. It runs with a narrator. And it's the story of the Lord Jesus Christ as told by Joseph of Arimathea. It's just a different perspective on the old story. And I trust tonight that as you listen, and if you open your heart tonight, and you listen, and as you see, I trust that the Lord will speak to you as the story unfolds then. So without any further ado, I'd like to present to you an Easter musical, The Offer Still Stands. stood and watched him die is no longer there the crown of thorns is lost and you won't see a cross or find his footprints on that hillside
Throughout history, kings, dictators, presidents, prime ministers, and politicians have promised the world peace and prosperity. Philosophies and religions have promised happiness and contentment. And today, everyone from authors to talk show hosts offer their own solutions to life's problems. Without exception, all of their promises and solutions have failed to satisfy the deepest needs and longings of the human heart. Long ago, God made an offer to the whole world. It was an offer of mercy we did not deserve and an offer of grace beyond our comprehension. It was extended from a rugged cross when God's only Son cried out, Father, forgive them. Centuries later, kingdoms have risen and fallen, but even though it's been 2,000 years since Jesus opened his arms and held out his love as our only hope, the offer still stands. My name is Joseph, Joseph of Arimathea. Yes, I'm the one who came out of hiding to bury Jesus in my own tomb. I'm not proud of the fact that I stayed in the shadows for so long, a secret disciple, you might say. But I'm glad I came out into the open at the end to identify with my Savior, whom I love. It may be that there is someone here like me Afraid to take a stand for the Lord Jesus because of fear of other people. Well, let me tell you again the story of God's love, mercy, and eternal life. Let's go back to the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Sometimes we're so overawed by the method of creation that we forget the reason for it. God, the king and ruler of the universe, made the world for us, his creation, so that we would have a place where we would know his love, where we would come to love him in return. Even when man turned away and rebelled against him, God never gave up his desire to win us back whatever the cost.
even though man had turned his back on him, God sent his Son, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, into the world, putting into action his plan to rescue man from sin. Jesus left heaven for one purpose only, to offer his life in exchange for ours. As he grew up in Nazareth, he came to realize more and more, as weeks turned to months and months to years, the limited time he had to meet the needs of so many. He began his ministry at the age of 30, and for the next three and a half years, he ministered endlessly to thousands of people who clung on to his every word. One of those was a woman out of whom Jesus cast seven devils, Mary Magdalene.
As Jesus moved through the towns, cities, and villages of Palestine, he found people in great need. People just like Mary Magdalene who needed help and love. Here are some of those people. I let them tell their own stories. I'm here tonight to tell you that I once was a leper. Ten of us lived in a village outside Samaria, separated from our families, from our friends, from our loved ones, plagued with this terrible disease, doomed to die, no future, no hope, nothing. Then one day we heard of a a rumor that Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth, would be coming through the village. Now, this was the same Jesus who was the teacher, the preacher, the worker of miracles. The same Jesus who was making the, the blind to see, the, the deaf to hear, the dumb to speak, the crippled to walk, even the dead to rise. Surely this same Jesus will one look where one touch, where one word could transform our vile, ugly flesh. We waited outside the village, away from the crowds, because they seen our disease and our plague as a curse, and they would have stoned us had we went too near them. And we seen them coming from a distance, and our hearts just leapt, and we cried with one accord, Jesus, have mercy on us. He didn't shiver or shudder away or, or turn his face like most people. But he looked at us and he said, go show yourselves to the priest. As we made our way down towards the synagogue, a sudden rush of heat ran through my body. I, could, and I, I realized suddenly that my legs, that I no longer had the lamp, that I could walk, I could jump about, that my face no longer burnt, that my body was no longer covered in scabs and flake and disease, and that my hands were clean. I was healed. We were all healed. As we hurried down that road, something compelled me to stop, and not to go to the priest, but to turn and go to him, that Jesus of Nazareth, that same man that had touched me. And I hurried back and I fell on my knees and I thanked him and I worshipped him. I just thanked him for what he had done. He had changed my life. He inquired of the other nine. I couldn't speak for them. I could just speak for myself and just give him my thanks. And then he said, go thy way. Thy faith has made thee whole. For the first time I felt clean inside as well as out. For the first time I, I was somebody. I had something to look forward to. He was going to be my future. He was going to be my somebody. And surely if he has done all this for me, what not can he do for you? Well, I was known as blind Bartimaeus of Jericho. And my testimony, well, where can I begin? For every day for me was an eternity. For as long as I could remember, I sat at the same place, day by day, begging to keep body and soul together. Then there was one day. Well, that day started just like many other days. I, I was sitting on the same spot by the roadside in my black world, hearing much and seeing nothing. Then I heard everyone talking about that young itinerant preacher, about Jesus who was going throughout the countryside, who was was healing and changing people's lives. And, And that morning I heard someone say that Jesus was coming to Jericho. Jesus was coming to Jericho. Jesus was coming my way. My, my heart had leapt within me at the thought of escaping from this prison that, 
that I'd been in all my life. And, and later that afternoon, I heard what seemed to be a multitude, a, a crowd of people coming my way. I thought, this must be him. This must be him. And as they approached, I, I started to cry, and I shouted, what's going on? I heard one saying, it's, it's Jesus. I heard another saying, it's the Messiah. Someone said, it's the healer. But I knew I could never get to him in my state, so I cried even louder, Jesus, thou Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. Some of those, some of those who were following him started to kick me. Some of the crowd told me to be quiet, but I became all the more determined, and I cried aloud again, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And suddenly the crowd grew quiet, as if someone had given them a signal. And as I learned later, the ruler, the king, the creator of all the universe, stood before me, calm and still. Despite all the shouting and commotion, Jesus heard me that day, a blind, insignificant beggar. And he told his disciples to bring me on to him. And as I stood before him, and under his voice, and what a voice, he said unto me, what do you want me to do for you? And I said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said, he said unto me, go thy way, thy faith has made thee whole. And immediately my, my eyes opened. No more pain, no more suffering, no more darkness, just color beyond my wildest dream. Jesus healed me that day. And his face was the first face that I ever saw. Oh, what a face to see and what a face to behold. From that day on, I followed him. He took away my pain. He healed me. He gave me my sight. But more than that, he gave me a new life. He gave me a new beginning. Jesus took me from darkness and gave me light. He can do the same for you tonight. I am a soldier of Rome, one of Caesar's elite, a centurion. One word from me and 100 men will rush to obey my command. I walked in vanity. I walked in pride. I cared for no one or anything. Those who were in my way were trodden underfoot. I was due for a fall, a big fall, and that's when my story begins. I had a favorite and most beloved servant whom I cherished dearly and found to be dying of the palsy. Not knowing what to do, I tried all the men of medicine in the area. There was nothing could be done. That's all they could tell me. And I had heard the stories about this Jesus. Jesus, that's all I heard. Jesus of Nazareth and what he could do. I despised the man. He was against everything I stood for. But desperate situations need desperate measures. And in that desperation, and still in my cynicism of him, I went looking for him. I hadn't far to look. There was the crowd. A large crowd, and there in the midst sat this Jesus. As I approached, many of the crowd scattered, because that's all they had known from me, hatred and fear. But when they realized I wasn't interested in them, and that I was heading towards Jesus, they stopped. Things went quiet. 
I approached him as he sat there. I dropped him my knees, took him by the hand, and he said to me, My friend, look up. What can I do for you? I looked at that man. I knew I was looking, even then, at no ordinary person. His eyes burned in me. And I said to him, Jesus, my most beloved and favorite servant, he lies seriously ill of palsy. Can he be healed? He said to me, my friend, I will come with you. I will come to your home, and I will minister to him. I said, no. I am not worthy that you should follow me. My home is not worthy to have you under the roof. But speak the word, and in my faith I believe my servant will be healed. Jesus brought me to my feet. He said, I have not seen such faith. No, not in Israel. Go your way, and when you reach your home, you will find your servant healed. As I approached my home, my other servants came running. Master, master, they said, he is healed. Healed, a new man. I went, I met him. It was true. He was back to the fullness of health that I had known him in before. That night, I saw every hour of the night, every hour of the dark night, and I was still awake when dawn came. And it suddenly struck me. This was what it is all about. Darkness into dawn, and my life from darkness into light. From that day, I realized I just hadn't spoken to Jesus, a man. I had spoken to Jesus, of my high priest, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, God's only Son. And from that day, I accepted him as my own and my personal Savior. I salute him. The day I met Jesus, I had lost all hope of ever being cured. I had never been a wealthy person. You might say I was comfortable. That is, until this issue of blood began. From that day, every penny I had was spent, seeking the help of the best doctors in the land, but to no avail. My condition grew worse by the day. Having this illness meant that I was considered unclean by friends, family, and church. Whatever I touched or wherever I sat had to be washed. I was alone with no prospect of ever being normal again. So you can see what good was money when I had lost everything I loved. Then one day, a man called Jesus came to my town. Everyone was there to see and hear him. As I listened to him talk, my heart leapt inside me. He talked of a kingdom that was coming. He said he had come to give life, abundant life, to all who would believe in him. He said he was the Son of God. I knew my time had come. Pushing through the crowd, I fought until I was almost beside him, but I couldn't get any closer. So I got down on my knees and I crawled between the legs of the people who blocked my way. I thought, if I can just touch him. I reached out and just managed to touch the hem of his robe. Immediately, the healing power of God swept through my body and I was completely delivered. As I tried to slip away, Jesus stilled the crowd and asked his disciples, who touched me? His disciples laughed and said, Master, everyone is touching you. Jesus replied, yes, but healing virtue has gone out of me. Someone has really touched me. 
I was frightened, excited, happy, all at the one time. I knew I had to come forward and identify myself. So I called out, Lord, it is me. I'm the one who touched you. I didn't want to cause any bother, but I knew if I just touched the hem of your garment, I would be healed. Jesus smiled at me. He said, Daughter, go in peace. Thy faith has made thee whole. I went away that day different. Oh yes, Jesus had touched my body and healed me, but he had also touched my innermost being. I met the Savior that day, and he changed my life forever. Even though the common people received Jesus gladly, he knew that the chief priests and the elders were scheming and plotting as to how they could kill him. It was the feast of the Passover, and Jesus with his beloved disciples assembled in the upper room. Judas Iscariot was also there. This was the night he would betray the Son of God. As they sat down to eat, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup and said, This cup is the New Testament in my blood shed for you for remission of sins. Then he gave the cup to each of them. Judas went out, and it was night. Jesus knew that the time had almost come when he would fulfill the purpose for which he had come into the world. After supper, they left the upper room and made their way to the Garden of Gethsemane. He took his disciples with him to watch and pray while he went on a little farther, knelt down, and prayed to his Father for the strength that he would need. Help this shepherd 
be a lamb The sacrifice for mortal man Help this shepherd be a lamb That must be slain to bring life once again How can I bear the sin of all? Father, will you intercede? And must the sacrifice be me? Once again, I hear my call. I can feel the agony, the weight of all the sin that's placed on me. No longer was Jesus surrounded by multitudes clamoring to hear his words and to feel his touch. Not even his disciples, faithful men that they were, could help him at this time. This was something he must face alone. This was the price that must be paid to redeem the souls of men and of women. The Savior became the sin-bearer. The silence of the night was shattered when the sounds of an angry crowd coming into the garden, shouting, waving torches that cast shadows on the ground. Ordinary people, soldiers, religious leaders, all led by Judas. Judas, who had seen so many wonderful things, had heard so many beautiful words from the lips of the Master. Judas the betrayer would condemn the Son of God with a kiss. From the garden, he was taken to the high priest where he was questioned and accused of blasphemy. Soldiers mocked him. They beat him. But Jesus never spoke. From there, he was taken to the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. Pilate was in a dilemma. He could find no fault in Jesus, but because of fear of the crowd and of Caesar, he sent him to be crucified. Like a quiet ray of sunshine in a darkened room, he came in. And I felt my heart within me long to turn away 
and hide from him. Who can he be? Can't understand a man so gentle, yet so strong. Why does this haunting song still echo deep in me? Who can he be? Who can he be? And what does he want of me? Now at last I've seen this prophet priest from Galilee Of whom I've heard And it angers me the way he stares into my eyes without a word Who can he be Can't understand a man so gentle yet so strong Why does this haunting song still echo deep in me Who can he be Who can he be and what does he want of me? What will you have me do with this Jesus who is called Christ? Crucify him! But I find no fault in him! Crucify him! But what has he done? Away with him. Let him be crucified. <coughs> From the judgment hall, Jesus was taken to the dungeon to be prepared for crucifixion. Soldiers mocked him. They beat him. They spat their vile saliva into his lovely face. They whipped him till he could barely stand, and then, and then in one final act of mockery and humiliation, they plaited thorns into a crown, and they pressed it onto my Savior's head. It cut deeply, tearing his flesh, causing blood to flow down his face. Hail, King of the Jews, they screamed. But Jesus never spoke. He knew he had been born for this day. Finally, they took him back to see Pilate, dressed in an old purple robe and a crown of thorns. Pilate took him out onto the balcony to face the crowd. He had had an idea, and he thought it might just work. It was a custom at the Passover that a prisoner would be released as a gesture of goodwill. At that time, a notorious terrorist named Barabbas was being held captive. Pilate asked the crowd, Whom shall I release to you, Jesus or Barabbas? But the crowd, being incited by the chief priests and the elders, cried, Barabbas! Release Barabbas! Crucify Jesus! Crucify Jesus! Pilate was afraid, so he sent for a basin of water, and he washed his hands before them, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just man. As Jesus made his way through the narrow streets of Jerusalem, he could barely walk with the beatings he had received and the weight of the wooden cross upon his shoulder. Crowds lined the streets. Some were crying in sorrow and disbelief that this was the way it would end. Others laughed and jeered. As he passed me, 
My stomach heaved and I fought back the tears. Jesus was taking my place. He was going to die for me. And I couldn't even live for him. I was so ashamed. He looked up, and I thought I caught his eye just a glance. But in that moment, I felt him say, Oh, Joseph, don't cry for me. There is no pain as great as my love for you. When they arrived at Golgotha, soldiers took the cross and they laid it down upon the ground. Then they grabbed Jesus and forced him to lie down with his arms outstretched on the cross. A soldier came forward carrying a hammer and a handful of nails. He began to nail my Lord to the tree. 
It was as if with each blow of the hammer, my Lord was saying to the world, I love you. I love you. I love you. All around the cross stood people, many of whom had loved Jesus and followed him wherever he preached. But perhaps the one who felt the loss most of all was his mother Mary. As she watched her son hang on the cruel tree, her mind fled back to the day in Nazareth when the angel came. She thought of how she had held him as a baby, had watched him grow and become a man. And what a man. Is this the boy I raise? Is this the son I knew? Is this the one I loved? Why can't they love him too? What has my son ever done to you? Has he caused you some pain? As I recall, all he's shown is love. Why can't you show him the same? This is the boy I raise. This is the son I knew. This is the one I loved. Why can't they love?
As Jesus hung on the cross, bleeding, dying, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Then, just before he died, as we stood watching, Jesus lifted his body as if in one last all-consuming effort and shouted, It is finished! The sky grew dark, rain poured from heaven, thunder rolled and lightning flashed across the sky. He had accomplished his task, redemption's work was done. The shepherd had become God's sacrificial lamb. The world would never be the same again. And neither would I. I felt completely different. The fear had gone. I knew exactly what I had to do. I had bought a tomb nearby, and I wanted to give that tomb to Jesus, to give him a proper burial. So together with another disciple, Nicodemus, we made our way to see Pilate. I felt no fear as I stood before him. Pilate couldn't believe that Jesus was dead already, so he sent for the captain of the guard to confirm that he was. We were given permission to take and to bury him. We made our way back to the cross to take Jesus down, anoint his body, and prepare him for burial. We were heartbroken as we climbed up to pull the nails from his hands and from his feet. We took him down, his poor dead body, and prepared him for his burial. We took his hands, oh, those hands, gentle hands that had touched the blind and the lame, had stretched forth to raise the dead and held small children, now cold and pale and bleeding for me. We took him down his poor dead body, and we prepared him for his burial. We took his feet, feet that had walked many weary miles to bring a message of hope and of love. We washed them gently and tenderly. We took him down, his poor dead body, and we prepared him for his burial. We took his head, a kingly head, now cold and pale and bleeding, took off the thorny crown and gently wiped his brow. No more the beautiful smile of love would come from those royal lips. No more would we hear the voice that could tame an angry sea and yet, and yet melt the hardest of hearts. Oh, we took him down, his poor dead body, and we prepared him for his burial. Two days had passed since the crucifixion. Then, on the morning of the third day, it began while it was still dark. The earth shook, the stone moved, the guards were terrified. 
in all our sorrow we had forgotten what he had said. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. alive and we could not contain our joy. We wanted to shout it from every rooftop that Jesus is alive. Death had been defeated. No longer would sin have dominion in our lives. 
His blood, His precious blood had made us clean. Jesus came to give us eternal life, abundant life. And today, you too can have this life if you only believe and put your faith in Him. His invitation to us was signed with His love at the cross, sealed at the empty tomb. And today, 2,000 years later, the offer still stands. Not bad for the local church. <clears throat> Brothers and sisters, we have been thrilled at what has taken place tonight. Did we show them our appreciation once more? <coughs> Wonderful. Let's stand. Yes.
You may be seated. <laughs> I want to thank Norman for a wonderful, magnificent job that he has made of these two choirs tonight. I want to thank our two choirs. Don't they look wonderful? <laughs> All the hard work, our musicians, everyone who has taken part, our sound men, and in particular, Joseph of Arimathea. <laughs> <laughs> had in a note. He memorized that wonderfully, and I think it was beautiful tonight. The Spirit of God is here. Can we just bow our heads for a minute? <coughs> Joseph of Arimathea came out of hiding, came out of secret discipleship, <coughs> took off his robe and revealed his uniform, let everyone know where he stood. The first person to know was Pontius Pilate. <coughs> yes, it cost him, and it cost Nicodemus. They fade into history tonight. We never read of them again. They were members of the supreme Jewish court called the Sanhedrin, 71 members. No doubt Caiaphas and Annas <coughs> and Alexander and John, all their family would see that Joseph and Nicodemus would never sit in the supreme court again. They didn't care. They came out and identified themselves with him. They loved the risen Lord. <clears throat> Sir, are you going to come out of your hiding tonight? <laughs> Lady, are you going to say once and for all, it's Christ for me? And while every head is bowed here <coughs> and every eye is closed and there is no one watching, only myself, is there a man here tonight? Is there a woman here tonight? A young man, a young woman, a boy, a girl <coughs> who will accept the wonderful offer from Jesus of Nazareth who is still alive tonight after the power of an endless life. If there's a man here tonight, will you come out of your hiding and say, <coughs> I want to serve him? Is there a woman who will throw off this cloak of secret discipleship and say, no matter who they're with tonight, I will love him and I will follow him? <coughs> if there's one tonight, would you raise your hand? <coughs> God bless you. <coughs> At the front, is there another one? <coughs> Is there another one tonight? <coughs> Over there, God bless you. I see your hand, friend. <coughs> Is there another one who will come out of secret discipleship and say, it's Christ and Christ alone for me? <coughs> Is there another one? Yes, I see your hand. God bless you. <coughs> Is there another one tonight? <coughs> the offer still stands. <coughs> He came on to his own, and his own received him not, but to as many as received him. To them give he the right, or the power, or the authority to become the sons of God, even to those that believe on his name which were born, not of the will of man, nor of the will of the flesh, but of God. <coughs> Is there another one tonight who will come out of secret discipleship who will say, 
It's Christ for me. Is there another person? Can I see your hand quickly and quietly as we close this wonderful concert? Is there another one tonight? Is there one more tonight? Yes, I see your heart. Now I am going to turn it. Four people. I think it's beautiful tonight. <laughs> now would there be someone who like Simon Peter denied him? <clears throat> you went back into the world. You've cried within your heart. Is there a backslider here tonight? And you'd love to come back to the Lord. Would you love to come back? Would you raise your hand? Is there a backslider tonight? Away at the back. God bless you, friend. Is there another one? I'm looking up in the great gallery. You once loved him. You once followed him and served him. The pressure was too great. But tonight you've been renewed in heart. You've, there's been a stirring in your soul as you've listened to the witnesses, as you've heard these beautiful songs. Is there another backslider? Will you raise your hand? Is there one more tonight? I'm asking for the final time. Is there one more? Just lift up that hand and we'll see it. Then, my friend, we will leave the issue with you. Those five people <coughs> that raised their hands, will you pray with me? The choir behind me is going to repeat this prayer. We're all going to repeat this prayer. Pray it out loud. Hear yourself saying it. Are you ready? <clears throat> Father, I come to thee. In the name of thy Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for sending him into the world. <clears throat> and I thank you that the offer still stands. Thank you for your offer tonight. By your holy grace, I accept that offer. Take me as I am. Save my soul from a lost eternity and live in my heart. From this night may I serve thee. Cleanse me in the blood that you shed for me. And anoint me with your Holy Spirit. Give me strength for each day. Give me courage to tell others. And give me grace to come out into the open and declare, I love Jesus. He's my Savior. I ask it all in Jesus' name. I ask it all in Jesus name. <laughs> Amen. Amen. And everybody said, <coughs> what did you think of the night? Was not worth coming. Could we show them all our appreciation again? <laughs> Now the night is young, it's only 20 minutes to 10. And if you're here in our church for the first time, we're delighted to see you. When you're going out tonight, Geraldine will be in the reception area. We have a brochure of the history of this church and what this church is doing. She'll give you a copy as you leave. There is no price, it's free. It's written by one of our choice young men and it traces the beginnings of Whitewell 
from 1957 when we started with 10 people <coughs> until this present day. And if you're hungry, and I know people came early tonight, why don't you visit our restaurant? I think there's egg and onion sandwiches. <coughs> there's apple tart. There's all sorts of dainties there. Why don't you get coffee, tea? I think there's Coca-Cola, there's Fanta, and there's no VAT-19. <coughs> so just visit there tonight and have a wonderful evening of fellowship together. <coughs> On Sunday, we will be here Easter Sunday. Two special messages will be preached morning and evening at 11 o'clock and a quarter to seven. <coughs> and Pastor Norman again will be leading our choirs on Sunday night. <coughs> we will be amalgamating together. <coughs> so we need you to be out to fill this house when they're behind me here on <coughs> Sunday night. So we're looking for a wonderful time in the Lord's presence. Pastor Norman Hobson, congratulate you on this wonderful night. Could we show him our appreciation? <laughs> thing now is you've started a precedent next Good Friday you'll have to have something else <laughs> so I'm sure you'll work out something and prepare something for next year of God spares us and may God lead every one of us on with himself and may he spare us for next Good Friday again <laughs> God grant that no one listening to us tonight will go out into eternity but will put their trust in the Savior. Will you stand with me as we separate? <coughs> We're going to sing, O Calvary's Lamb. <coughs> We're going out in a couple of minutes. Just stay with us. <coughs> o Calvary's Lamb. <coughs> and drive careful, and may God give you journeying and traveling mercies. Are you ready then? Oh, Calvary's
you. It's been wonderful tonight. For those people that raised their hand, we have a room just there straight out in the foyer called the McGee Room, the McGee Room of Learning. <coughs> Van and Bobby Young will be in that room, <coughs> and they will give you some literature and take your name and address so that we can keep in touch with you and encourage you in the Lord. You raising your hand is not to make you a member of this church, no. But we want to encourage you and help you get your first steps in the faith to strengthen you in God. So will you go into that room before you leave tonight and receive some literature? Thank you once again all for coming. And I think you've got to show everyone again behind me your appreciation. Amen. God bless you. <laughs> Can I just say this? Uh, we're so caught up with the Lord Jesus tonight. We forgot also what this musical for Easter was to raise funds for our youth center. <coughs> And we thank you all for coming and what you have given uh, helps to pay the bills. We have just erected the steel. If you can see it when you go out tonight, there's plenty of light. Have a look at the steel. It was just finished yesterday. Now we have to get the cladding on it, and we're really pushing on. We raised half of the money in one Sunday. We need the other half. And if anybody here tonight has 150,000 that they don't want, <coughs> see me after the service. I'll take you out for a Chinese supper. <laughs> and you can give me the check. Thank you once again. And God bless you. Let us pray. Loving Father, we thank you already that you've been one of our number. <laughs> thank you for all that has taken place in this great house tonight. Thank you for the choirs. Thank you for our musicians. Thank you for everyone who has taken part. Bless them tonight and encourage them, leading them on with thyself. Thank you for all who have traveled near and far in this province tonight to come. We pray that you will give each one churning and traveling mercies, covering every car, every bus with the precious blood of your dearly beloved Son. Now separate us with thy blessing. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, <coughs> the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest, remain, abide upon us until Jesus comes. Amen. Amen.